Yeah, I think I've always thought of intimacy as verbal things. Yeah. And for so many people, it is never going to be that. And I overlooked all these ways that, like, this person expresses love. And just because it wasn't verbal, I, like, didn't count any of it, which is so unfair. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Uh, we're not for everyone. I'm Caroline, and Jess is with me. Physically. Physically, our knees are touching. Our knees are our one knee is touching. Just Should one. Yeah, both knees. <laughs> Let's turn and make sure both of our knees will if, kneel towards each other. If we sat with both <laughs> touching, I think our lips would be touching too. They would have to. Would have There's to. no other way. At least our noses. <laughs> okay. Eskimo kisses. We're one knee touching in person in my apartment recording um, Jess is visiting DC today. And that means a couple things. Mm. It means the sexual energy is always very high. <laughs> I'm wet immediately as soon as I walk in here. It's much more intimate. It also means that we share one microphone and it's a lot harder to edit out. When we yell over each when other. When we yell over each yeah. other. Or say something stupid. Like I, I do a lot of like comments under my breath, I think. <laughs> You hit the mute button on your mic and like say something while I'm talking just to get it out without yeah. having it recorded. Sometimes, I see it. <laughs> sometimes I mute myself because I can't be trusted not to talk. Um, and that doesn't work when we're sharing a mic. I right. could just mute. If I feel something bubbling up, I could still mute the mic, but it means I'm going to cut out everything you say. Right. Maybe I'll do that. Just say it. No, just, it'll just go silent. <laughs> the whole podcast will go silent for a moment, and you'll know that Caroline said something that you can't hear, and that means you can't hear what I said either. Yeah. And it's fine. I don't really care about anything I say. I was going to say. <laughs> as I've communicated many times, it's like, you know, it just rolls off the tongue, and then I move on with my day. I don't want to... I don't want to be held to it. I don't want to hear it again. So I think, you can feel the same about the things I say, I, I would think. I'm a lot more precious about what I release into the yeah. universe. It's pretty painful for everybody who works on the podcast. <laughs> it's not. It's just a matter of reassuring you, empowering you. Um, those are my goals when it comes to our partnership. I'm feeling pretty powerful. Are you? Your birthday's coming up. Oh my god. Uh, it's like in two when? days. Oh my right? god. What the hell? Oh my god. I will say that's part of the reason I planned this trip, low-key. You low-key love. I was like, maybe she's going to be gone. That's totally fine. I need to see my family anyway. Aww. But if she's going to be around and going to want this raw sexual energy on her birthday weekend, then I'll be available. You raw dogged me for my birthday. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Yeah. Do you up. care about birthdays? Like, what's the hot take? Oh, yeah. I can spin them into something pretty negative, I would say. Sure. Yeah. Um... Do I care about them? I think I do. I, I wish I was the chiller person who was like, I don't even care. No, the problem is totally that I care. Yeah. And I put pressure on it and I make it mean all these things about me and have to do all this self-reflection and what does it say how I, about me, you know, how I spend that day. Yeah. Um, the problem is, as always, I have no chill and I do care. And also, <clears throat> I do have a pretty strong feeling about myself that... Anything I organize, I just organize it the wrong way. I'm not good at organizing things. Actually, I was trying to figure out what to do on my birthday, and I texted you. I was wondering if we were going to, yeah. if, if I'm allowed to say that. I texted you to ask for feedback. On it was adorable. <laughs> I get this paragraph long text from Caroline like three days ago, and she's like, hey, not podcast related. I really need your specific help with my birthday plans. Like, this is what we're doing. I already knew. Like, she had told me weeks ago. Because you're coming. Because I'm coming. <laughs> I already knew, like, she had a time. She had a location. We, there was a plan for her birthday. And it's been communicated to me a few weeks ago, which I assumed meant it's been communicated to the other people that you want to come. But still, now days out, you're, like, overthinking it. And you're like, should I do more? Like, do we need games? You were like... <laughs> Should I make an announcement? I was like, if you have something to announce, like, what's that mean? I don't know what that mean. <laughs> like, prepare a speech for everyone that comes. And it's like, I'd like to announce that I'm doing great. 
And, like, I'm happy you're here. Like, what was the announcement going to be? No, I thought the announcement would be beforehand. Like, is there something I should tell people? Like, right. something that they should be... That, that they, they should, should know, know coming in. Yeah. Well, are you planning to do something that, like, would be unexpected? And, and wouldn't you want to leave it unexpected if that were the case? No. <laughs> no, I just feel like this is why I thought you might have input. Because... I really didn't. <laughs> I was like, I think th I, this is where I reassure and I empower. No. I was like, I think you have it all all set you're providing the location you're providing the time drinks will be flowing people will be laughing and if they're not that's their problem i know but the other thing i'm providing is the energy and the energy is wrong <laughs> why is the energy wrong <laughs> the energy is wrong because when you're hosting something the mutlock everyone derives the energy from the host and i'm a yeah. terrible host. i'm an anxious host i'm self-involved <laughs> it's your birthday i think you're allowed to be you know that's actually something if to you lean wanna, If you want to go to a party that like puts you on edge and is self-involved, <laughs> like I got you covered. This reminds me of we had this conversation a few weeks ago on our dating episode about my first date with my boyfriend. I'm gonna raise my hand when I have to cough. Oh, please. That's what I'm, I'll wait. I'm not in a rush. That's what I would usually mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, on my first date with my boyfriend, I did most of the talking. I was very nervous. I was very anxious. He also was, but the way that shows up in him is like silence. And the way it shows up in me is like, let me tell you every story of my life and just get it all out now so that you know that I'm funny and interesting and whatever. So I was doing that. And at some point I caught myself doing it live in the date. And I was like, oh shoot, I'm talking so much about myself. I'm so sorry. Like, it's not only about me. And I'll never forget his response. He goes, it is about you. Like, this is a, you're on, I'm on the date with you. It is about you. Oh, that's such a sweet response. It was such a sweet response. And I was like, I know, but I don't want to be that person that's like, just talking about myself and not asking any questions. And he was like, you're allowed to be, it's fine. He was like, please don't ask me a question. Yeah, I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared. You came with stories. I came with nothing, just vibes. Um, but I feel like it's similar. You're allowed to be self-involved at your birthday party. Ugh, it's I'm Walk around and entertain the people. No. I'm going to be doing that at your birthday party. I'm going to be like, listen to all my best stories. I'm here. That, I'm only in town for three days. Actually, you get me briefly. That's the best gift you could give me is that you do it. Because like my general vibe at parties, this is what I end up doing at a lot of parties. I can talk for like a, a little bit. I can chit chat for a little bit. And then I just want to sit. Totally. And I and I don't want to talk to anyone. And I started, I, I had been, for a while I felt uncomfortable doing that publicly just like sitting alone in a corner and, and being seen not talking to anyone but now I'm very comfortable with it it's mm. where I'm happy but I've realized that other people at the party are still uncomfortable seeing it if you are at a party where everyone's hanging out and then you just sit on a bench in the middle of a garden party graduation event and you just sit there <laughs> this and is a specific it's, memory it's, that you're recalling and it's not it's not a bench off to the side it's like you're in the center it's like a bench in the center of everyone. it's almost like you want to be seen how I really didn't want to I sat there I tried to be silent at my friends like graduation and um this was actually very recent it was a much younger friend who was graduating and I I sat there for a while and people kept trying to come over and like console me and I was like no I didn't want to be left alone so eventually what I've learned to do is to go, I like walked into the house, this person's house, and just found like a dark bedroom and just shut myself in and just yeah. sat in the dark in a bedroom where I'm very happy, but no one has to, I don't have to subject anyone else to looking at me. Yeah, I think that's smart because I am the person that sees somebody at the party like uh, secluding themselves You're and my separating nightmare. themselves. You're my nightmare. And I'm like, I hope they're okay. I won't go over, I won't yeah. necessarily go over and check on them, um, but it will like, put a thing in my head where yeah. I'm like, is this person having fun? Especially if it's my party. It stresses me out too. I feel bad for that person too. Yeah. 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 But I'm having a good time. So I don't know if I'll be doing that at my birthday. Okay. I might go sit in a room alone. But if you could be there <laughs> just entertaining the crowds. Will you tell people it's your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> be careful because I would. <laughs> Very easily. Oh, we have the same birthday yeah. actually. What else? What else? I flew here. This morning, I'm like fresh off the plane. You're fresh as hell. Right into your apartment, right into your womb. Um, I feel safe. And I don't know, that's just what I wanted to say. Um, and I feel like there were so many airport moments. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. 
I can't work like this. <laughs> I don't want to cough over you. I know. Um, mainly, so I get on the plane. My row is empty. It's all for me. Delightful. Happy. Happy as a clam, as they say. And, and, the, and the flight attendant's like, ma'am, please stop referring to this as my row. <laughs> there are other people who bought tickets. And you're like, I no, bought the row. my row is empty. <laughs> <laughs> my row was empty. It stayed empty. Um, but there were kids in the road directly behind me, like young, yes. like two years old type of kids. And, you know, it's fine. I have compassion for the parent that's like having to deal with their young child on a plane, maybe for the first time. I'm sure that's stressful, whatever. But this parent, it was one of those parents that like really wasn't doing shit. I think they probably subscribed to a like, oh, don't tell my child no ever because that Ew. will traumatize Ew. them. Ew, shoot them in the head. Right. That parent cannot be allowed to live. So this kid's like opening and closing the tray table behind my chair, like running all around. He put his bottle on my, in my row. He like came around in the aisle and dropped his bottle off. I was like, this isn't for me. Uh, this is my <laughs> row. I paid for it. And um, it was just kind of annoying the whole time. And then when the plane landed and we were all getting up, the mom apologized to the person in the row diagonally across from hers, like unaffected human. Meanwhile, yeah. I've been tortured this whole flight. Wow. Says nothing to me. Cause I think I give off like a really mean, intimidating energy or I'm trying to. Oh, that's wild. In to flight. Picture. In, in flight. flight. In flight. In flight. Even though I've been told I look like a nice person to sit next to on a plane, I'm trying not to look like that. So I think I probably succeeded this time. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I can't believe that th that that woman got an apology. I got shit. And then that woman goes, oh, there's nothing to apologize for. I was like, speak for yourself. I was directly yeah. in front of this child. Like, I have a list of complaints, actually. <laughs> Is this when I can share my complaints? Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, that's just, I don't know. I just needed to get that out because this is... Right when I land, yeah. I need to say what happened on the flight yeah. in order to move on with my You have to decompress. Life. No, yeah. I think that's a great opportunity to trip a child, <laughs> aisle, especially, or put your bag out. Like, if they're being so reckless... That could be a real consequence. Make it a consequence. That's so true. Learn your lesson. If you're being reckless, you might trip and fall. I'm so caught up on this concept of a parent who won't say no to their child because that's going to traumatize their child. First the fuck of all. I know. First the fuck of all. Let's say that that wasn't already a stupid ass thing to do. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to try. <laughs> For all of their childhood. And then they get released out of your home into the rest of the world where the world will be saying no to them. And they've never encountered a no before. And now you've rendered them completely unprepared with how to respond to someone giving you no. What is it? How do you think this is going to play out? I know. Okay. It's, it's become like a parenting trend almost. I feel like I see it online. I, can, I like, cannot. I do cannot. It's a certain theory, a certain mindset, a certain like approach, and I am scared of okay. it. Okay. There's lots of low IQ people out there on Instagram. Right. We can't, we can't even give them a time day here. I know, but that's everything you see on Instagram and it's everything everyone else is seeing. And then it's informing me. My fear is that it's sinking into the minds of like higher IQ people because that's what the internet's feeding us. Oh, and then it becomes everyone. No, listen, I'm not worried about it because I will say no to your child for you. Yeah. I am there yeah. to ki trip your kid in the aisle. That is so wild to me. Mm. Gross. I, there, gross. There's so many things about parenting that I won't touch on because obviously I'm not a parent. I'm just saying this one I'm pretty comfortable with. Oh, totally. I do not care if this offends you. If this offends you, unsubscribe. Yeah, fair, You need fair to be enough. saying no to your child. Cosign. Oh. Hi. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh. Was that a lull that or a, a lull. okay, but like a <laughs> exasperated lull? Yeah. Lull. <laughs> lull. <laughs> lull. Um, What's going on with you? Do you ever have intrusive thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was having them all morning. What were they? Like death and stuff. Okay. Like what if the plane crashes? Oh, I was driving yesterday. This happens sometimes when I'm driving. And like my brain will just be like, what if I just drove into that car? Yes, that's the one. Yep. Yeah. So somebody wrote in, um, a listener wrote in on Instagram about intrusive thoughts. And when when I think of when when I think of intrusive thoughts, I think about like picking up to me it's like it's not what if the plane crashes. Mm. It's something that I might do. Yes, yeah. I could crash this car into the median immediately and just kill everyone in the car. Mm -hmm. Kill everyone on the highway. I could pick up that knife and stab my family members. I um obviously I feel like it's worth discussing cuz it 
feels so terrible. Yeah, you, to have those thoughts, but it's it you is spiral. You're like, am I a bad person for even thinking that? Like, it really is normal. And there's there's probably a spectrum. I think, obviously, that can be a, a symptom of an actual um, condition that really plagues you. But I have a lot of intrusive thoughts. Yeah, a lot of intrusive thoughts. Um, how do you manage? Uh, it's like they're gonna come. Yeah. So how do you manage like the aftermath and like what your brain does and your body and your emotions do when when they come? It's tough. I feel like in the moment, the best thing I can do is to do nothing. Like sometimes, I'm not gonna pick up the knife and stab my family member, but it makes me feel a lot safer to put more distance between me and the knife. Mm-hmm. Um. And, and then when you're away from it, it's hard in the car. It's hard when you're driving because it's like you can't step away and you're just, you have to keep driving. Um, I get the same thing with heights. Like all I have to do is jump off this ledge. I could just jump off. I can just jump off. Who like, it's just a step. I'm capable of taking a step. I could jump off right now and ruin everybody's life. There was a, it actually came up on my second date with Justin, my boyfriend. We went to, I talked about on the pod. We went to see the moth and we were in this theater and we were up on like a balcony and it basically the entire time mm. I was thinking about jumping off the balcony compulsively um, and just being like, all I have to do is like take two steps and throw my body off the balcony. Like what would he do? After? Right. What would he do? What, what would he do when my body's impaled below <sighs> on the floor of the moth? Like what would he do? Well, isn't that interesting how sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes part of the motivation of an intrusive thought when you explore it is like, how would other people react? Like, Mm. would they be sad? Would they be scared? Like, would they, uh, what would the effect be if I were to just like jump off this thing and Uh, die? Do you know what I mean? To me, it's not, I guess it's kind of exploring it. I, my, mine, I'm not exploring how he'd react in terms of like, would he like it? Would he be sad? It's right. more like it would be so terrible and how would he... In the moment. It would be so terrible for him. Like that, he... First of all, second date, he doesn't have any attachment to me. It would yeah. just be like, I went on a second date and this girl killed herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would just be like, wow, that girl was super weird how she killed herself. You know? He wouldn't be sad. I sometimes, with my intrusive thoughts, that makes sense, but sometimes we'll take it to like, take it to my funeral. And take it to, like, what are people going to say about me? Oh, then that person will finally find something nice to say about me. Wait, what? That's not where I go. (laughs) That's where I go sometimes. No, mine is very guilt-ridden. Like, oh, my God, I could ruin everyone's life. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, mine is way more about me. I think yours yours might be a fantasy. (laughs) In a way, yeah. Actually, it is maybe a fantasy in a weird way. It's like, I know I'll never do these things, but... Um, and maybe that's a way I've trained myself to like channel the thought so that it doesn't go to a dark, shameful place. And instead it goes to like a place of like, then I'll be celebrated or some shit, even though that also doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. They happen all the time. When I was driving the other day and I had that like quick moment of like, what if I just drove into this car in front of me? Yeah. Of course I get to where the car is and it's at a light. So I'm slowing down and I was going to take a right turn um, and I took the right turn and it's, it's a very instinctual turn. I drive this route yeah. all the time and I was like, oh, look, like my body knew to turn here and not run me into the car because I think part of the fear for me is like that my body, like you said, compulsively, like that my body will just decide I, oh. I'm afraid of heights. And I think the reason is because of this thing of like, like in my mind, logically, I'm not going to jump off this height or I'm going to be careful and not, you know, test falling off. But what if my body just flinches and flings me off? Yeah. I'm very clumsy. I, this is the thing. <laughs> I was near a cliff recently and I was like, I stumble all the time. What if I just stumble that way? Right. Yeah. So it, it's like a thing. But then it not was good to see yourself. like, oh, my body knew what to do. Yeah, it is. It is about trusting, trusting yourself, yourself. I think for me, it's more fear about like the core of me is bad. Mm. And so the core of me could just like, if I'm thinking about it, that's what I really want. Anyway, I think, I think in therapy, a lot of the time, the way that they treat that is exposure therapy, which I can't say I would necessarily try. The exposure therapy version would be letting yourself pick up the knife and just hold it and proving to yourself. Like in therapy, they'd be like, the therapist has you pick up the knife and they have you hold the knife to them to prove that Whoa. like you're not going to stab them. 
That makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that. I don't recommend. And I'm not a therapist. This yeah. is just an example. That seems pretty risky. I don't want to... Because, like, what about the one in a million person that does? Yeah, I'm not into it. Right. But for me, it does help when I have some distance from it to be like, okay, well, if I was so desperate to stab everyone and crash my car, I've had, like, 31 years to do it. <laughs> yeah. I've had 31 years to do it. I haven't done it yet. This is the same way that I deal mentally with the ghosts trying to possess me. I'm like, they've had... Okay, if I'm haunted, they've had 31 years to possess me. Like, they're not fucking chomping at the bit to possess me. Yeah, yeah, I'll, fair enough. My, maybe not yet. They're taking their damn time. Taking their time. <laughs> and um, I'll probably, you know, if I stab someone, it'll be the same day I'm possessed. Actually, that would make sense. Yeah. But then the other thing I think is like, I don't, the I don't have intrusive thoughts about stabbing a random stranger on the street. I have it about the people I love most because that would be the worst. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it helps to prove to myself it's anxiety. I'm fixating on what's the worst possible thing that could happen. The worst possible thing that could happen is that I'm to blame for hurting the people I love most. Um, that's the worst possible thing. And and I'm fixated on it because I'm an anxious person. Uh, and it, it helps to think of it that way. I'm not, I'm not thinking about stabbing random people on the street because I just love stabbing people and I think it would be fun. Like, that doesn't yeah. occur to me. It's not really the same. So it helps to reframe, like, why? Because I think the fear is, like, oh, I must want to mm -hmm. stab my family. No. For me, it's, like, fear of your own potential. Hmm. Fear of yourself. Fear, I don't know. A fear of the worst case scenario. Yeah. I, something that's helped me, oh. <coughs> Are these all staying in the YouTube version? I don't know. I think they are. <laughs> okay. Wait. Oh. Do you need water? No. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just have like a persistent cough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think another thing that's helped me with them is... Once I became aware that this is something that is very common and that many, many people experience, um, I started to even think to myself, like, okay, let's say I have a thought of what what would it what what would happen if I stabbed my family or something. Then I'll be like, okay, hold on, I'm like obviously never gonna do that and whatever. And I, I run through the motions that Caroline just described, and then I say to myself, they probably have these thoughts too. Mm. And like Making it specific, like, oh, yeah, like, my sister probably has had the same thought about me, as opposed to just generally. It yeah. does help to be, like, generally people experience this, but then in the specific moment actually being like, she's thought that. Neither of us have done it. That's funny. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Like, that frees me from the shame of it as well, um, because that's, I'm sure that it's true. That's why I wanted to talk about it, because I, I completely agree that so much of the shame is being like, this is so perverse, I couldn't ever speak about it. And I think most people have it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. Just dream about your sister dreaming about stabbing. About stabbing me. It's yeah. comforting. It's yeah. like, oh, cool. She has equal control in this. Somebody else wrote into the podcast um, saying, actually, let me read the exact thing. Hold on. Somebody wrote in saying, I'm overwhelmed by group chats. Love the kooks, but I can't keep up with their hilarious jokes all day. FOMO. First of all, I think wait. I like how they position I was just that. Like, first of all, she wrote it in such a sweet, funny way. Yeah. That they're hilarious jokes. My first reaction. I hope everyone knows how I feel about this. My first reaction is that oh, yeah. texts are not for jokes. Texts are Whoa. not texts are not for jokes. I don't be trying to make jokes on text. Even with your best friends, I who like would know the tone and know that it's joke. You know I what I mean? I don't care to. I'll throw it in, but I don't care to. Oh, you know I'm making jokes on text. I know you're making jokes, and I, and I do be making a few jokes too. But you do. I do be. You do. do. You're allowed to rest your leg on my. Okay. Leg. Are you comfortable? <laughs> yeah, it actually like helps. Okay. Pressure. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm. Um, I will throw the joke in. I want to get in and out. I want to get in and out. It's like, to me, it's the same as making jokes at the counter of the DMV. Like, I <laughs> yeah. I will make a joke there if it, if I, if it is needed, but I'm trying to get in and out with the text. Yeah. I do not, and a group text, literally when I was texting people <laughs> to come hang out for my birthday, 
I texted on a bunch of different random group chats. Yeah. Mostly because, and one friend ended up on like my sibling group chat and she was just like, where am I? <laughs> That's a weird thing. But I specifically didn't want to unite people into a group chat because it is so horrendous. If I if I texted everyone on a group chat, I would have had to say, do not reply to this text. I always do. Do not that. thumbs up. Do not heart. Do not ask a question. Yep. And then I was like, that's probably unreasonable because they may actually have questions. And then I'm going to be like, is anyone excited? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> okay, but like, tell me you're not interested in this at all. Or like, um, I do that often is I send a big group text because I've talked about First Fridays on here. The thing where I have like 30 people on this big group text about this happy hour that happens once a month. Nightmare. And... I do it that way because I don't want to text each of them individually and I, I don't want to have to manage all these separate group texts that yeah. I do have with different select groups of them, but I don't want to deal with that. So I have one, I've titled it, titled it first Fridays and I say every month when I text the information about the event, like don't reply to this, don't heart it, don't anything. Um, if you have questions, text me directly. Is it total silence then? Do no, people, people still do it. And that's, Something that I haven't talked about. That's what I'm saying. People, but they'll hear it when they listen to this. People, what are you doing? People cannot be trusted. What yeah. are you fucking harding it? Yeah, harding I it. I just said don't hard it. Well, exactly. I just said you're blocked. Right. Now you're blocked. Yeah, maybe that is the answer. Group texts really do. It's funny because I feel like when I was riffing, in college. Riffing on a group text? No. But it, okay, do you agree that it changes over time? What do you mean? So in my life, the way that I use a group text and enjoy a group text has changed a lot over the last like 10 years. Back in the day, like when I was in college and we were kind of just having access to the even concept of a group text oh, or we, like a Facebook messenger group thread or we whatever. We used to riff more. We used to riff all the time. Um, there would be like Facebook groups that you would just make with your like five best friends or whatever and like share memes all day and be chatting back and forth all day. That eventually for me trans transferred over into text world and we were doing a lot of that riffing and back and forth and like doing bits and banter and whoever's available joins in and whatever and then over time it's like we're busy we're busy we're busy i know i i would say i do not have a group text i don't have any group text that exists just to keep up with people i will say the the main exceptions to me bantering over text are the people who live elsewhere and there's no other way to have a relationship with them. Right. It's maybe three people um, that I do enjoy and I get a lot from chit-chatting, riffing, bantering in a group text because that's where the relationship exists. Mm -hmm. For anything else, if I am going to see you in person within one to two weeks, yeah. I do not want to have a conversation with you over text. I would agree. I'm so, I, I feel like I'm so busy and the free, and when I'm free, I don't want to be on my phone. I know, but you have to be because you're like, I have all these text notifications. I have all these Instagram DMs. I have all these other things. Like the phone, it's, it's because it's not just group text. It's like the group text, the individual text, the text from your mom. You know, it's like, it's everybody in your life. And then it's also on Instagram. And then it's also on whatever other platforms yeah. you use. So I do agree. I think like there are certain relationships where if that's the only way that you communicate, great. In those situations, there does need to be an understanding for me at least of like, if I'm not responding right away, if something goes completely never responded just because like I was busy and I didn't get to click on the link you sent me. And so it just disappears into the abyss. Like we're fine. We're still friends. And like, that's just how it rolls sometimes because I feel like yeah. some people... Um, oh my god. We'll get really like Shoot touchy em. about that. Shoot them. And then I can't be in a well, no, we're not text friends. back and forth no, with you. No, we're not friends. Yeah. Um, I would say if I'm not responding, it's because I'm busy. And that happens to other people too. Like yes. when they, when someone else in that group chat gets busy, they're also not responding. If they are, it's just because they have time on their hands, which is fine. And then they might disappear like 10 minutes later, later and that's fine. <laughs> the main thing... um that I've learned with the group text. So I, I really don't relate to the FOMO aspect. She wrote and she was like, oh, FOMO, fear of missing out because she can't be in the group text. I don't relate to that, but I would say that I really strongly feel that for relationships that you do also encounter in person, there's like no overlap between the text. There's almost no overlap between the text relationship 
and the in-person relationship. Mm -hmm. Like having a conversation in a group chat on text doesn't really carry over to the group dynamic in person. I don't find, I find that they are two completely separate relationships. Do you know what I mean? I think so. So there's two ways to look at this and I agree with half of it. So I think what you're saying, like the keyword is the dynamic because basically it's like, okay, if you're experiencing FOMO in a group chat, it means you feel like potentially it may, means you feel like all my friends are talking without me and they're like fostering these funny, fun, lighthearted, ongoing relationships that I'm not taking part in. And so when we're together, what in person, what will that mean? I, and to yeah. that, I say it will mean nothing. I don't think it they're actually over. not fostering anything. That's what I mean. They're I just passing the time. I don't think it carries over at all. Yeah. I don't think that they show up to the next in person hang feeling more bonded. Right. And I can't prove it. I got no data to show. I've done zero research, but it's just something that feels true to me. I guess the other thing though is like maybe, <clears throat> maybe. I don't, I don't even want to like, um, amplify this mindset, do it, but maybe this person is afraid of it. So I'll acknowledge it. Like maybe they are feeling like, oh, she never chimes into the group chat. She must be like really disengaged from the friend group. Well, that's when I do. That's what I'm saying. That's when I do chime in. Yeah. It's not because I love texting silly jokes. It's because there is some, I know there's some degree of work that goes into relationships that feels like this is what I do. I, I will set aside texting people back. It goes on my to-do list mm. aside from everything's like, everything's on your to-do list. Everything's on my to-do list aside from honestly, like my boyfriend and my closest friends, which includes you replying to texts is something I do between the hours of nine and 10 in the morning. If you text mm. me after that, I'm probably not replying till the next day. I will set it aside like an hour of my work day, 30 minutes, whatever it takes. And to reply to all the texts, all the DMS, all the whatever. Um, I literally, I set it aside like I'm responding to emails. Yeah. Um, that is how much it feels like work to me, even when it's people I love. So there is an aspect of it where it's like, I do not ever want to text anyone pretty much ever, but I will set aside 30 minutes of my day in the morning to do it because you don't want to be completely absent. I can't just be, it will send the wrong message. Yeah. So I'll do the work. Yeah. That's what I mean when I'm saying like, yeah, someone will do it. That's, I'm really interested in that. Like I want to start doing that because I've been feeling lately like, my whole life is on my phone. Yes. Um, I work a job that's fully remote. I'm on my computer eight hours a day. I then have this that's also on my computer. Most of the time we're recording over Zoom. We're communicating about the episodes over text, things like that. And then my social life and talking to my friends in between the times when we're actually going to be in person and with my friends who don't live in the same place as me is over text, over FaceTime, over Instagram. Um, I'm posting things on Instagram to like entertain people, whatever. This is a me problem and I'm not complaining because I also enjoy a lot of that. I think it's just the reality of like, yes, like your, your work is now becoming more social media. I think that I'm sensitive to it because so You've been doing it for working longer. in social media, it, I think it makes you hate your phone. If you're a reasonable I'm person, getting there. if you're a reasonable person, I think it makes you hate your phone. I'm getting there. And like, I think the time boxing might be a really good solution for that and it's something that you can do even if you're not you know oh yeah working in social media and, and spending all your days on your computer like Everybody's if tired. you get overwhelmed by your phone which probably most of us yes. do i let's think normalize like these are the times i'm on my phone and the rest of the time i'm not it's kind of like work hours um office hours like and first of all mm. i don't think i'm special i think pretty much everyone's tired of their phone obviously but um why that became effective to me is because what's what's most disruptive first of all it's really hard for me to context switch it's very like yeah, i need to get too. focused on things it's, my phone is on do not disturb pretty much 24 7. yeah it is <laughs> i have the little moon caroline has notifications all silenced all the time but um, i still be texting I know. <laughs> but um but what's the hardest for me is the constant drip throughout the day. It's like I get through 30 minutes, then I have to respond to another text. 80 minutes, then I have to respond to another text. 30 minutes, yeah. then just, and the fact that it like it never stops. Yeah. I don't know. It, this is a. I feel like when I'm talking about it, it sounds like a pathetic complaint, but I it's know. really wearing me down. So I don't know if you relate to that. 
I only really respond to texts <laughs> during the 9, 9 to 10 a.m. workout. It's a good day. announcement to make. Maybe I'll send an, an announcement, speaking of your birthday announcement that you were going to make at your party. Maybe I'll send an announcement to my first Friday's group text, which is pretty much all my friends who live in Chicago. Yeah. And be like, FYI. I don't even know if you, why do you need an announcement? But, do I don't I, know. I'm so weird about that, actually. I always feel like if I'm going to change up on somebody, I, I need to announce I it. I don't even know if they notice, though. This is the other thing I in know. my head. I think I get stressed about replying to texts, but, like, people blow me off or, or, or disappear in the middle of the conversation, yeah. and I never think anything of it. I think it's like, yes, I agree, but maybe, maybe some of it for me is, like, I feel like I've set a precedent for pretty much my whole life until oh, recently oh. that like I am going to respond pretty quickly and I am going to like laugh at the jokes with you on text and banter with you and I'm also going to like be on top of plans and I'm also going to whatever it's like and probably no one else cares I feel like I've set that precedent a little with people but maybe more I've set that precedent with myself well I do <laughs> understand if you're yeah people know on some level if you're super prompt with text they could take it personally yeah yeah but like that's so i guess that's why i'm announcing right now like this is an announcement i'm not gonna be prompt anymore is this your announcement for my birthday yeah you are... i'll announce it at your party too at your hang <laughs> and everyone's gonna be like none of us know you yeah, I know. <laughs> if you're trying to get in touch with me too bad <laughs> you're like just i'm the only person here who has your number <laughs> abby Abby! Abby. I Abby answer are, Abby like Abby immediately. Abby. I think she thinks I'm crazy. I'm always the first to respond in our in our text thread. But like whatever, I'm waiting. I'd be waiting for the NFE text. I'm not I'm not on my phone for anything else. <laughs> I tune out as soon as it turns to banter. I feel so overwhelmed because I'm working if I'm texting on the not for everyone text chain. It's work related. And then we go and then into we banter switch. mode and I'm like, I don't I can't. I know it is hard. I'm really bad at at separating and this is something I feel like I've talked about a little bit um but not just in text like in life in general now that my life consists of so many more like modules of things yeah you know it feels very modular to me oh, and I okay. have to like switch between work podcast I'm now starting to do freelance work like social time relationship time me time I really have a hard time switching and on days when I have like a meeting for work followed by a meeting for freelance followed by like going to hang out with my friends or something i really i i talked about this last week i context think context switching context switching is hard for me like totally. going from recording the podcast to i have a work call right after this is gonna be fucking weird yeah i luckily i don't care what they think but yeah. you're, gonna be, you're gonna be weird on that call yeah bro. you're gonna be giggling like hell i don't know i think i have adhd anyway Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> can I add something on to the last conversation we were having? Totally. And if we don't like it, we can cut it. Yeah. Like if it makes it go too long. Um, Because I had written down along these lines of like, I think I have ADHD and context switching is really hard for me and stuff. Um, how perfectionism gets in the way of either getting started on a task or bringing a task over the finish line. Do you experience this? Like, Yeah, I made a whole video about it. Yeah, it's called The Problem Is You're a Perfectionist. Frick. I've definitely watched that. Maybe oh, okay. I need to rewatch. I've oh, watched okay. all your videos. Um, <laughs> just like subtle flex. Um, big fan. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm noticing this recently at work and pretty much in every part of my life. Like the reason I procrastinate is because I need it to be perfect. And so I'm like, Either it's daunting to get started because I'm like, well, uh, we need it to be this whole big picture awesome thing. And so, like, let me create the plan to make this whole big picture awesome thing instead of taking it step by step and looking at, like, just just do the, the smallest part of it first and then go from there. Um, and similarly, maybe I'll get over that hump and, like, get 75%. This is almost worse get 75% of the way through a task oh. and then bringing in, bringing it over the finish line is impossible because mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, now I have to like do those final perfectionism tweaks and somebody else would probably submit it as is right now. But because I'm this way, I'm like, no, I need to go in and make everything perfect. And that will take me weeks to do. There's a task. I'm pretty sure 
that I talked about it on the podcast like two months ago and I was like, oh, there's something I've been procrastinating at work. I just this week finally did it. Really? And it was one of those things going from like 90% to 100%. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm looking something up. I don't know how to deal with this, but I think it's the more things that are on my plate and the more that I have to context switch, the worse it's getting. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a perfectionist thing. Um, that's why I made a whole video about it because I saw it in myself. Um, the things that I would, you know, we're both people who have a pretty good work ethic and work hard at things. And I don't know, it's one of my goals now to work less and less. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to work, <laughs> but I've gotten a lot of shit done in my life. And when I procrastinate these days, I notice it's because I needed something to be perfect. And the, the higher, it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, standing at the foot of a giant hurdle and feeling like you have to jump from a standing position on the ground. You have to jump over the whole hurdle mm-hmm. without like a running start. And it just feels so insurmountable that it feels impossible. And why would you even try? Um, yeah, especially when you have you don't have that momentum propelling you. Yeah. The getting going. It's actually what is so difficult, I find, is not the doing. It's the getting going. Um, that's why I feel like so much of the perfectionism or procrastination advice is to do five minutes, do a bite-sized amount. I have to tell myself I'm only going to film the intro to the video or like something to get going. Um, another thing that has helped in, in tech. There's this concept of an MVP yeah, minimum viable product probably applies to a lot of other areas, but like what is the most watered down does the basic functions, checks the basic boxes version yeah. of this thing I'm trying to complete and doing that first. Maybe that means you're writing something, dumping a brain dump of all your thoughts. It is not well written, but doing the brain dump onto a paper. Um, and like, it's technically all there. It's not very well edited. It's not well composed. It doesn't flow. It is not perfected. Yeah. Uh, but it is so much easier to go, to have that done and then to go back and do all the fixing mm-hmm. um, after that. Or recently, I stayed up till 2 a.m. editing a video and I did it in kind of a rush because I was running short on time and whatever I just have to get it done and I stayed up late editing it because I couldn't my brain could not even entertain the idea of having to do more editing in the morning I'm so over this I'm so at the end of my rope I don't have the energy to take the perfectionist steps over the finish line I'm just putting out something that I can put out finish at 2 a.m uploaded it to YouTube, didn't publish it, but like it was ready to go. And then I woke up with a little bit of sl- sleep under my belt and in the you know light of the morning, I was like, okay, I could go edit a little bit more. Yeah. And I went back and edited more and I had to like re-upload, re-export and re-upload the whole video before publishing. But I'd gotten that minimum viable product out of the way and that allowed me like the energetic space to do those perfectionist pieces to get it over the finish line. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have I have done that before, and that sometimes it helps. I think if it's something I care about, like with you in a YouTube video, um, it's easier to do that. When it's something I care less about, like a task for my day job, like it's a little bit harder to cross that finish line. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that plays into this is I find for myself, like I'm a very like all in focus for one hour or two hours or however long and get the whole thing done. I love to just sit down and crank out pretty much the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I might, you know, sleep on it. And then the next day have some fresh ideas of like, okay, let me just like tweak this little part, tweak that little part. You know what we want to be done. Um, But I want to like sit down, do it all when I have the energy for it, when I have the focus, when I have the time. And that's not the way life works. Like how often do I have like a four hour chunk to just sit down and do that thing? Very rarely. How would you, how would that not stall you out? I feel the same way. That's why I was like, I'm not going to edit this more in the morning. I'm going to finish it tonight. I would much rather stay up late to finish it than whatever. But like, then of course you can't go going. You're like, I have to do it in this limited time window and it has to be the final ultimate perfect product. Like 
No, you probably can't do it. To me, hearing you describe that, it's so relatable. But what if you sat down in that moment and you were like, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do a bad job of this. Like the goal, the the, the goal is to do this and do a bad job at it. Yeah. Do the laziest, sloppiest, you barely are skidding by bad job. That's, that's the assignment is to do a bad job at it. I don't know if that would like release... Yeah, and you're probably. Ne- you're never going to submit. It's so crazy you're, that it's like not occurred to me. You're not going to submit a bad job. That's not something you're ever going to do. Right. But if you, it, there is a little bit of just like trickery you can do. It's just so much easier once you have something on the paper. It's so much easier. The hardest part is starting. Yeah. The hardest part is actually thinking about it. Yeah, just waiting to start. Totally. And it all lives in your head. And you're like, you can't even go to sleep because... Yeah. You have all these thoughts. I am good at that of like, okay, if I have all these thoughts rushing to my head about a task I need to start and like so much so that I can't even fall asleep that night, let me just like write a note in my phone and brain dump a bunch of bullets so that it's out of my head. That's a great move. I am good at that and that's very helpful. Um, Yeah, but then I want like, I want the five hours dedicated that the number just keeps going up every time I talk about it. I need the two years dedicated. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the thing that's tricky about cycling on it in your head, I think it's, uh, I think it's self-reinforcing because if I'm stressing about a video that I have to start, but I haven't started it, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, and I'm actually expending all this energy, mental or emotional, on the project, worried about getting it done, how am I going to get it done, trying to get it through it in my head, only going through it in my head, and then you still have nothing done. So it reinforces this idea that you'll never be able to do it. Yeah. And that's why I think it's dangerous. It's, it's, um, the worst part is thinking about it because it just reinforces to you. I've put days, weeks of energy, mental energy towards this thing. That's real energy. And it's amounted in nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, um, that's why you have to like start physically doing something. Sometimes to me, I'll be like, Okay, you are going to sit at the desk and you're going to open the computer and then you're going to open a document and you're going to type gibberish letters onto it and then you're going to set a timer for 90 seconds and you're going to write for 90 seconds and then you can take a bathroom break yeah. and like, and that's all it takes to get going. Yeah. Okay. This is super motivational. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I feel like I go through cycles with it. You know, oh, like I've, course. I've told myself these things before and implemented them successfully before And then you find yourself back at square one and you're like, how did I just get through like the past three years of doing all this work? I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And like now I just feel like a lazy fuck and I can't do anything. Like how did I just do, how have I done all of this? I, it just happened. I I don't know. I think it's also kind of getting older and giving less fucks. Even though I care about a lot of things I'm doing, I'm also like, also, nothing I do matters. Yeah. Like, also, yeah. I do, literally, I have all these procrastination tips. You should totally go watch the video I made. It's called The Problem Is You're a Perfectionist. Um, it's an okay video. It's But good. it's fine. I liked it. <laughs> but uh, literally yesterday, I got a message from my, like, YouTube brand manager. And she was like, hey, is the... Um, preview video ready for the sponsor like i have to send if there's a sponsor i have to send the video to the brand first so that they can be like you're allowed to put this on the internet and sometimes they have a lot of problems with things <laughs> i do and there was one exchange where i think at some point it was a it was a room makeover and at some point i muttered under my breath like in frustration i was applying wallpaper to the wall and i said like suck on my butt <laughs> and this brand was like you need to remove the phrase suck on my butt and i'm i was like first of all they're not allowed to control what i say it was outside of the sponsored part okay they're not allowed to have any input on that it was actually a completely inappropriate request from them interesting and so i pushed back with my manager i was like they're they're not even allowed to watch the rest of the video they're not allowed to, and, and it was this hilarious moment where i was like also i said to my manager I was like also i'm sorry that i'm making you email them about the phrase suck, suck on, on my, my butt. butt yeah to, to actually be that's a very powerful position to be in I mean, where people are writing down in business emails the phrase suck, suck on, on my butt God. because of you good for you um and i actually did end up taking they went back down i took it out of the video but like i would never work with them again um how did i write this down? oh have you ever been in the position of negotiating with your partner when your anniversary is. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a very common, relatable thing. And yeah. it's like, why is that? It's funny. It's also funny because 
actual anniversaries are like when you get married. Right. And so it's like there's actually all this energy that goes into your like, well, was our first date? When did we start? When did we be official? And it's like then as soon as you get married, people don't give a fuck about the Yeah, other. they're like, okay, that was the day that the venue had available, so that's your anniversary. But until then, you want things to celebrate, and I do anyway. Totally. And I also want to make my partner relive with me all of our earliest <laughs> memories. So I'm like, would it be our first date or would it be like that time, like a few weeks later when you cooked me dinner? Because that really felt more like relationship -y. Oh, really? Or would it be when we actually called it exclusive? I feel like that's too late because we didn't really have that conversation right away, but like we were exclusive. So like, what do you think? Like, tell me what how you felt at oh, all those junctures. Okay. It's me trying to be like, Let's talk about <laughs> cute memories uh, and decide. Well, that's nice. If that's what it gets you, then who cares? I guess so. It's great. I definitely feel like, oh, for sure it's your first date. I, I guess. I think that's what we decided. But after our first date, like three days later, I like kissed somebody else. Does that matter? No. <laughs> it was a random man. No, I don't think it does. I don't think it matters. I was thinking about Ryan the whole time. It's, it's like when you first met each other. That's yeah, exactly. What, that's what the dating anniversary is, when you first met each other. I think I agree, and that's where I think we were building from. I would not, I would be so confused if someone told me their anniversary was like the fourth date. I know. I would be like, wait, what? And they're like, well, that's when I stopped kissing other people. I would be confused. Right, but I did ask. I was like, does it matter if I like... I was still on the apps. And I'm like, I'm sure you were on the apps too. It wasn't just me like catching up to what we were doing. But yeah, I don't, I, I agree. You're so weird with the things you come up with. How would it not be your first date? I thought the question was going to be like, you guys first met in a group of friends. And even though I know you met on a dating app, yeah. but like, it's not clear. No, you're like a clear date. Well, but it's not clear. Okay. If it's the first date, then it's clear. When did you first fall in love with me? Yeah. Or I, like, just I, tell me the story. I have. <laughs> you love me for yeah. sure you for sure love me i've definitely asked justin that and been like when did you know you're falling in love with me and he pretty much was like i don't know <laughs> he was like i don't know what happened over time and i was like well for me it was this moment <laughs> but of course we like assign those things in retrospect i feel like yes we assign, it's like no, in that I, moment you probably all, definitely had a special moment in that moment i i announced to myself speaking of announcements, announcements. <laughs> I announced to myself like every other day that I was falling in love with him and then I would get stressed out and anxious and I would be like well someone if I loved someone I wouldn't feel this anxious and so then I would be like I'm mm. not in love with them and I was like announcing and re-announcing it to myself every other day it was very confusing to me for a while and I had <laughs> I'm very sentimental so sometimes I would this is so self-indulgent, but I would like take a selfie sometimes in these moments where I felt like so pure and so happy and so sure and like I was falling in love with this person, but I couldn't tell it to them yet. And I would take a selfie because that's how I could remember the moment. That's very cute. Of me just like in bliss on the floor at the gym, like while texting him and I was like, oh my God, I'm in love with this like person. Like thinking about him. Yeah. And so I, but then the next day I would be like, no, not in love. And so I have a series of like eight different selfies where I was like, this was the moment. This was the for sure, this was the moment. And then I'd go like get upset and I, I was just in my head a lot. And I, so I kept being like, if I'm in my head, it can't be correct. Right. Yeah. Which is, I don't think that can really be true because I'm in my head all the time. So Exactly. Well, that is, that is one of the really hard things I think about, about forming and starting a serious loving relationship is like, you're going to be in your head if you're a person who's in your head a lot. Like, I'm an overthinker. I'm an anxious person. That doesn't change just because I found somebody that I love. Oh, it ramps it up. Ra oh, Ramp 100%. It ramps it up. 100%. I'm going to be analyzing everything. I'm going to be begging you to recount the story of when you first looked into my eyes because I need yeah. reassurance all the time. Like, it is a very, um, if you look at it that way, it's very up and down. But if you just think about how you feel it. It's like centering. So I like that you took those pics. I wish I had done something like that. I do kind of like them. Yeah. I, I took pictures of every time that my boyfriend cooked for me in the first year of our relationship mm. and then made him like a little picture book of because all of the meals. Shut the fuck up. Because I'm so cute, honestly. Cute. I'm the cutest to date ever. I'm so cute. Okay, so fucking cute. this is the thing. You took pictures. This is a huge revelation for me recently. And it's like no duh, but I really need this to, to think of it this way or to be told this, you took pictures of those moments because on some level you actually did know that that was him. 
communicating his love for you. Mm. It's not like, first of all, lots of fuckers have cooked me meals and it was not them communicating their love for me. Right. But you identified that as a really like connecting, loving moment with your boyfriend. And something that I think I didn't, it was, it's been hard for me to probably appreciate is really just that I'm such a verbally effusive person. I tell everyone how I feel about them. I do it with you. I like to text you in moments where I'm feeling really appreciative or really grateful or just really good. I do it with my sister randomly. Like I do, I do it with an uncle. Like I do it with people I care about. Mm. Um, I want to always put in writing really cause like I think I think to some degree that's the text I would love to receive. Yeah. I would love to hear how you're thinking about like your feelings in our relationship, whatever the relationship is. And so that feels like a really important thing for me to do to people and not just to wait till their funeral to say how I feel. Yeah. Um, that's exactly why I have those thoughts, totally. by the way. And I, and I don't know about your boyfriend. It sounds like it may be similar, but at least Justin, we've even talked about the fact that he is not as much into the verbal things. Yeah. And that really was hard for me to believe. I, I just didn't, and he, and he communicated this very clear dedication and seriousness in dating. He, it was so clear. Like it was so consistent. There was there, all of his behavior mm -hmm. was so, I mean, just so clear, clear in this way. But he wasn't as big on the language. And and so I didn't believe any of it. So I was like, so it meant nothing. And that really, like, now thinking about it, was pretty unfair, pretty ridiculous. Um, and I started reading this book recently that I can't shut up about mating in captivity. And it just highlighted, it, it talks a lot about like sexual relations, but it's, it's so much more than that. It's just intimacy um, as an item in relationships. Intimacy can be emotional. It can be verbal intimacy. I think I've always thought of intimacy as verbal things. Yeah. And for so many people, it is never going to be that. And I overlooked all these ways that, like, this person expresses love. And just because it wasn't verbal, I, like, didn't count any of it. Which is so unfair. I yeah. Know. No, I, I very much relate. I mean, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself about it. Although I get it because I'm also hard on myself about it. But words of affirmation is a real love language. And it's a way that you make a point to show your appreciation for people. And I yeah. agree, it's probably because you're like, I would love for people to show their appreciation for me in this way, occasionally. Yeah. Um, my boyfriend is, yeah, not, that's like probably his weakest love language. Um, maybe gifts, but we both don't really care about gifts, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and that has been a hard thing. And it's kind of weird because there's, <laughs> there's like, a lot of a lot of people talk about how believe what they do not what they say you know like believe when somebody's consistent in their actions the way they show you that they care the way they show you that they're going to continue being there for you yeah and i do really believe that like i do think there's truth in that type of mindset mm -hmm. but if you're a person who whether you like it or not whether you can help it or not yeah values words then it can be hard that the words sometimes aren't there um it's a lot easier to look at it in retrospect like there will be days when i'm just so thirsty for like for words and yeah. that's why i do these fucking little weird childish games of like when's our anniversary oh no. now you have to tell me about about how you felt in our early dating because it. it's seeking it's seeking that conversation it's seeking those words of affirmation i don't think it's childish at all to be clear i, I like that I, I guess, but sometimes I guess that's me being hard on myself about it. I'm yeah. like, you know, can't I just see the consistency that this man brings to our relationship? Can't I just see the other ways? And it's always hindsight is twenty twenty. It's like the next day when he's at work and I'm at work and we're no longer together and I'm like thinking about our relationship and thinking about the night before and all the sweet things and all the fun things and whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, what a what a loving guy I have. Yeah. But um, if it didn't show up in words, kind of like in the moment, I'm like thirsty for the words. I think it's valid, of course, to want to try to meet each other to some degree on like both, wh whatever people need. The thing that was just interesting about the book, it this book at one point it called out how usually 
learning verbal intimacy is the ulti- is is kind of held as the the trump card like that's what we all need to be working towards mm. we all need to learn to express ourselves verbally as if it's because the truth is it's just a different way like it's a different preference for you it's a different preference for me but i do i think i have been thinking of it as like and a lot of people do is like well you need to learn then yeah. you got to learn and to justin's credit He's, he has learned. He does a great job of it. But um, to think of it as the ultimate, it's not yeah. the ultimate. It's like something he can learn to do for me. But it's not, it's not m- m- yeah. like objectively more important, actually. Yeah. I, I think know. I think that's right. I really want to read this book, Esther Perel. Dude, right? it's so good. Yeah, yeah, I really want to read it. Because I, I do feel like it is a trump card. I'm very... Uh, it's very easy for me to express how I feel with words. It's like the easiest. It's it's easier than yeah. my actions. It's easier than doing things for other people. For me, it comes naturally. I've always been able to do it. Probably to a point where like I do it so often and so uh, freely that like, I don't know, maybe it loses some of its value. Maybe no, like I, I do. I do think about that for myself. I'm you like, know? sometimes I got to ration this shit out. Right. Exactly. Or, it's or gonna try mean, to try to show it in other ways. Or it's going to mean nothing. That's the thing is like, there's this attitude in ge- broad generalization, but there's definitely this attitude of like these men as a generalization who aren't like able to verbally express themselves. Like they have to come into this century. And it's like, maybe they're super good at expressing things in a different way that I need to work on. They're yeah. just, they're just different. Yeah. Yeah. Plus one. <laughs> Kiss it. Kiss it. Are we done? We're freaking done, dude. Wow. It feels so good to do an episode and just solve all of the world's problems. I know. Every week. Every week. Every week. And then when we're in person, it's that much more efficient. We're like, what's the next problem? Next, the next problem? problem? Okay. Sick. We're done. Wrap it up, slut. Oh my God. It's me. Yeah. Okay. This has been Not For Everyone. We're a podcast. You're here. We love you for it. Um... You can find us on Instagram at not for everyone pod. The number four is in there. Not the number four, everyone pod. Follow us. We be posting some kooky shit. Um, I'm Jay-Z DeBakey on Instagram. Caroline is on YouTube. Caroline Winkler. And I think that's it. I think that's it, bro. We love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I'm so happy we're together. And <laughs> Caroline's going to cough now as soon as we... As soon as we wrap up. Now that we're done. All of her coughs that she's been saving while we've been talking. I don't know if it made it onto the podcast or not, but I had to come up with a silent signal so that I could cough and not cut you it's off. It's going to be on YouTube, Pretty so good. we'll leave that for YouTube. Oh, and Abby. And our editor, Abby. She's the best. Um, if you have audio editing needs, she is interested in taking on more work, so you can DM her. Um, go to our Instagram and go to who we follow, and it's Abby Newhouse, and she's in there. Okay. That's it, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Have I been on screen most of this time? I don't know. Bye.